Um, so I'll be talking about hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity. And when I was trying to think about what topic I want to present on, I remembered the first Irish webinar that I watched, which must have been about six years ago. And Cliff Froelich talked about induced seismicity in Texas. It was actually the, the first uh, time I ever heard anyone publicly speak about induced seismicity. So I just got into the topic and it was right before AGU. Um, I learned a lot from that. Um, so kind of in preparation for this webinar, I went back and watched Cliff's talk again. And I realized that a lot of what Cliff said is, is totally accurate and it's still true today. Um, but we also, also learned a lot, um, particularly about hydraulic fracturing. Um, so I thought I'd kind of like uh, face my presentation as like an, an update of what we learned since, since Cliff's talk. Okay. Um, so this is actually a screen shot straight from, from Cliff's uh, IRIS webinar. And I think he did a really good job of, of describing the, the general occurrence of these different types of induced seismicity. Um, so I thought I'd kind of show his slide and then kind of uh, edit this slide um, based off what we know today. Um, so in terms of, of drilling induced earthquakes, um, at the time that said, uh, said never happened, and we do have cases now where the drilling process, process itself has induced earthquakes. And we have cases where the operator will drill directly into a fault and simply the, the, the drilling mud um, is enough to sneak out into a fault and cause some seismicity. And those tend to be very small magnitude events. Right? The hazard from those is, is very small, um, but it's very important that the operator recognize they induce the seismicity and they, they had that mud loss because it can indicate that they, they intercepted that fault. Um, in terms of hydraulic fracturing, um, I would kind of bump that up from, from very rarely to, to sometimes. And this, is, this is largely the emphasis of this talk that hydraulic fracturing induced earthquakes is more common than we thought about five years ago. When it comes to extraction or injection of, of fluids, um, I think Cliff's assess assessment that this is a sometime occurrence is, is still accurate today. And our community has certainly learned a lot about these uh, uh, different areas. Uh, but Cliff is, is definitely on the bottom. So when it comes to Cliff's Cliff note, which I think is hilarious, I, I love Cliff's name, um, I would kind of edit this to say that hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity is a relatively rare occurrence. And by that, I mean, on a global scale, you know, very few um, uh, percentages of these, of these uh, wells will actually induce earthquakes. Um, but it really depends on the spatial scale that you're talking about. Right? So this wear component is really important. So on a global scale, it's relatively rare, but on a more local scale, um, it can be a lot more common. For example, uh, in a given uh, county, a majority of the wells that are stimulated may induce earthquakes. A majority of wells <laughs> inducing earthquakes is not a rare occurrence. So again, it depends on the spatial component of what you're talking about. Um, so when we have these occurrence rates, I think we should, should be really careful about uh, quantifying um, that. Kind of thing. So uh, my apologies to Cliff if I'm throwing him <laughs> under the bus here. Uh, you know, Cliff has been studying induced seismicity uh, pretty much longer than I've been alive. Uh, so he's done a lot of great work. Uh, I, I hope I don't offend him by, by updating on the slide. Uh, hopefully, regarding you're getting some of my karma, um, I'll throw myself under the bus. All right, so this is a, a case sequence in Ohio. Um, that occurred a few months after the spot. Um, so this is up to magnitude three in Ohio. Um, and the very first sentence that I wrote in this abstract says that felt seismicity induced by hydraulic fracturing is very rare with only a handful of reported cases worldwide. Now at the time, it wasn't just Cliff and I that said that these were a rare process. Um, in fact, the National Research Council got together a panel of experts and they concluded that hydraulic fracturing does not pose a high, high risk for inducing felt seismicity as well. So this is the, the general understanding um, at the time. Now, if we kind of jump forward to today, um, it looks a little bit different. Right? So the largest earthquake induced by drop fracturing that's been published was a magnitude 4.7 in the Sichuan Basin of China that occurred a few years ago. Um, this caused uh, quite a bit of damage, about 23 houses collapsed and 500 um, um, buildings were damaged. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, just about a month ago, in the same basin of China, there was a magnitude 4.9. So this caused like, two deaths and over a dozen injuries and millions of dollars of damage. So this is work that is, that is still being um, um, conducted um, by uh, the, the Chinese uh, colleagues. And I'll be talking a little bit about this uh, event later on. Um, but uh, their interpretation so far is that this was induced by hydraulic fracture. So kind of the question is, how do we go from only having a handful of documented cases to now having potentially um, hydraulic fracturing um, induced respects that kill people. What, what has changed in that time? So first, I want to give just a very brief overview of induced seismicity um, because I know there are some some non-seismologists who are, who are watching. 
Um, so there have been some great talks previously um, on IRS webinars, you know, not only from Cliff Froelich, but also Justin Rubenstein and Gail Atkinson about induced seismicity. Um, so I'd really encourage you to check those out um, if you have not seen those yet. Um, so when it comes to induced earthquakes, when we say that, we're talking about any kind of human activity that alters the stress along a pre-existing fault that then leads to an earthquake. So the, the focus of this talk will be on hydraulic fracturing, um, but there are many different types of human activities that can induce earthquakes um, that include wastewater disposal, um, reservoir depletion, mining, geothermal, carbon sequestration, dams, and even uh, a few months ago, we published a case where the usage of a spillway induced some, some micro seismic events, which <laughs> also leads me to, to rethink the nature of the seismicity. So this uh, issue has been known for, for decades, um, but the issue became kind of reignited um, in the past uh, uh, 10 years or so, um, at least in the central and eastern United States. So if you look at the number of catalog earthquakes um, that are mentioned 2.7 and larger, you see that there's about 50 earthquakes per day. But around 2008, this started to change. And now we're kind of at the rate of, of 2,000 earthquakes per year. This increase in seismicity can be uh, wholly explained by uh, human processes that are inducing these earthquakes. Right. So I think uh, one of the, the coolest studies uh, was also one of the first studies that have been done in new seismicity. Um, so this is a case um, in, in Rangeley, Colorado. Um, so this uh, uh, Chevron had an oil, uh, oil field at, at Rangeley. And some people noticed that there were some earthquakes that are coincident with the wells. So I'm not sure how it happened, but some USG scientists from the office here in Menlo Park were able to convince Chevron that, that <laughs> to allow them to do a scientific experiment with their wells. So these uh, scientists went out and they started playing with the injection parameters. Right? So they'd kind of flip a, flip, flip a switch, um, they'd turn on the injection and they saw the earthquakes would occur. They'd then turn off the switch and the earthquakes would stop and they did this repeatedly. Um, and they wrote this really good uh, uh, paper about that result. Now, although the science was really good, I, I still think that this is the closest seismology has ever come to the realm of mad science. Right? This idea of, of going onto the field and intentionally causing earthquakes is, is pretty, a pretty crazy idea. Um, in this case, the largest magnitude is the low magnitude for these right? so nothing too large, but, but still kind of a crazy idea by, by, by today's standards. So recently, um, some scientists have, have still done some experiments of injecting fluids um, into faults, but the very, very tiny volumes, nothing on this kind of scale. Um, so I still think that this is a, one of the best studies that have been done, and I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to be drawing a dis distinction between the terms induced and microseismic. So as I said previously, induced is any earthquake that is caused by some human activity that changes the stresses along that piece of fault. Now, most of the induced seismicity in the United States has occurred in the pre-Cambrian basement. Like we absolutely can induce earthquakes up into the, into the sedimentary strata. Um, I'm just trying to uh, make this point to try to draw this distinction that the earthquakes can occur outside of this interval that's being extended. Okay. So this figure is a, as a profile. Right? This, this kind of dashed line is the well that, that's drilled. We're still waiting in this interval in the sedimentary strata. And about 700 meters to a kilometer below it, that's where we see the earthquakes. So I'm trying to distinguish these events from microseismic. Right? So microseismic are the seismic events that occur as a process of the fracturing of the rock, right? So when they inject those fluids at high uh, volumes of pressures, they're fracturing the rock, they're opening those up, and some um, seismic energy is released from that. Right? So these microseismic events are common. They're expected at virtually every well that is hydraulically fractured. Now, these events occur primarily within the interval that's being fractured or in the immediately adjacent um, um, intervals. These magnitudes are no larger than magnitude one. Um, we can also look at things like Gutenberg Richter B value, the B values for microseismic tend to be very high, somewhere around B values of two, um, whereas induced events are more typical kind of B values of one. Okay. So the kind of point here is that microseismic events, we know that they occur for you know, virtually every well. For the purpose of this presentation, we're not concerned with these events. We're concerned with induced seismicity. Okay. So for the first of this talk, I'll be talking about these induced events. So if we look at kind of a roadmap um, of induced cases, uh, this is what we see. So in the late 1900s, there were a couple sequences uh, that were published that, that may be related to hydraulic fracturing. Um, by today's standards, these are a little bit ambiguous, um, whether or not it was actually induced by hydraulic fracturing or the process of extraction. Um, but I think it's, it's reasonable to assume that these were, were likely induced by hydraulic fracturing. In the 2000s, we have some very convincing cases uh, that, that we're confident about. So on this kind of roadmap, I added my Cliff Curlitz webinar. Um, you can add the National Academy of Sciences um, report around here too. And then we have our paper um, that we said the hydraulic fraction paper, uh, the hydraulic fraction um, paper. 
Now, if we look past this point up to present, right, this is what we see. Right? In cases, you know, a lot of basins, we have dozens of cases. Um, of course, in China and in Western Canada, we have seen rather uh, large events up in the magnitude fours. But most of the cases um, in a lot of basins are still in the three uh, kind of range. Um, it's important to note, though, that these earthquakes are very shallow. Um, they tend to just be a few kilometers deep. Um, so people are feeling these earthquakes, you know, even at the kind of the magnitude two level. Right? So people are feeling these events, and there's a lot of these events that people are feeling. So it can be a real nuisance. In some cases, it could be a, a significant hazard. So kind of the question is, why is hydraulic fracturing induced surface system more common? How do we go from just a handful of cases to now having hundreds of cases that, that have maybe even killed people? Um, so kind of the first reason that I give is that hydraulic fracturing itself is more common. So hydraulic fracturing is not a, a new technology, right? We've been doing this since at least the 1940s. But it wasn't until the early 2000s that hydraulic fracturing got merged with this technology of horizontal drilling. So these oil companies are now drilling vertically a few kilometers and now drilling horizontally a few kilometers as well. And now they're capable of, of hydraulically stimulating that entire horizontal interval, um, increasing the permeability and extracting all the, the oil from that. Right, so this is what's led to the, the rise of unconventional uh, reservoirs. This is what has catapulted the United States to becoming the largest oil producer in, in the world. Now, if we look at the number of these uh, uh, horizontal hydraulic stability wells, I'm sure in dark blue, we see that there are now more of these wells than all other types of, of oil wells in the United States from my life. So hydraulic fracturing has become a very common occurrence um, in the recent years. So related to this, um, with this new technology, it has allowed for new formations to be economical. Right? So with these new formations come differing levels of seismic hazard. And I think a great example of this is up in the Appalachian Basin. So this is sort of the northeastern United States. Um, in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, primary unconventional formation is Marcellus, um, which is over a kilometer away from the basement. Um, but when you cross the state boundary into Ohio, the, the primary target interval um, becomes the, the Utica Shale which is a lot closer to the basement. And you can see that um, relationship here um, in, in this figure. Um, each one of these uh, dots represents a well that was drilled, and the color of that dot represents the proximity to the basement. So the cooler colors are closer to the basement, while the warmer colors indicate wells that are further away from the basement. Um, it's not able to see, it might be easier to see in a cross-sectional view. Right? So here's A and A prime, this is what that cross-section looks like. So again, we have this shallower Mar Marcellus in green, and the speaker uh, a Utica shale in red. And this gray polygon down here is, is our basement model. So we noticed fairly early on that the cases of, of deep injection, either into the, the basal sediments or directly to the creek and the basement, tended to have a, a greater likelihood of inducing earthquakes. And we saw the same kind of occurrence with hydraulic fraction. And along this cross section, we only saw induced cases um, associated with uh, the, the Utica shale for hydraulic fraction. So we tried to expand this deal for the entire Appalachian Basin, in addition to the Illinois and the Williston Basins. This is kind of a summary figure from that. So along this y-axis is the proximity that, the, that a well is to the basement, and along this x-axis is the percentage of wells in that distance bin that induce earthquakes. So wells that are drilled directly into the basement or into the basement sediments had about a 10 to 15 percent chance of inducing earthquakes, whereas um, all types of wells that were drilled um, shallower um, had a, a decreased likelihood. I'll, I'll say again, you no, know, we absolutely still can induce earthquakes up into the seven tier layers, um, but most of the earthquakes that, that actually are induced are occur down in the basement um, for these basins. Okay, another reason why we see more hydraulic fracturing induced system missing is that we're now better at detecting it. Okay, so in terms of detection, a lot of my work uses template matching. So for this, we'll take the waveform from a cataloged earthquake and we'll cross correlate that waveform against years of continuous data, trying to identify similar waveforms, um, but at a, a, a smaller magnitude. Right, so we've gotten really good at this. Um, we can now detect events that are, that are totally buried in, in noise. Um, the repeating signal detector has a kind of a similar goal, but it doesn't rely on a catalog. The repeating signal detector takes some kind of continuous uh, data set and identifies the repeating events that are buried within that. Now, both of these techniques, um, pretty much they only depend on a signal to noise. And we're very fortunate that at the time that the, the new system kind of uh, started taking off in the United States, we had this transportable array moving through the United States. So these are uh, high quality instruments um, that can be deployed uh, very well with sort of uh, uh, 70 kilometer station spacing. 
Um, and these have a very good signal and noise. Um, so when we apply these methods to, to these instruments, um, we can some, get some pretty impressive results. So I think a good example of that is shown here in this figure. Um, so this is a case um, in Ohio where we identified a couple of earthquakes. Um, these are catalog earthquakes. And we noticed that these were in proximity to a well that was, that was being stimulated. But with just this information, it's really hard to convince yourself whether or not it's induced. Right? There's simply so many earthquakes and so many wells just by chance, right? you would expect some earthquakes to be approximately to a well that's been stimulated. But when we apply uh, these methods to this, this transport, transportable array data, we can turn those two earthquakes into thousands of earthquakes. All of a sudden, the, the picture becomes a lot more clear. We can plot the time that they were doing, uh, that they were doing stimulating, they're, they're stimulating the wells by this red line up here. And you can see that there's a good agreement between the stimulations and the earthquakes. And so it's nice and quiet before the stimulation. When we start the stimulation, we get a bunch of earthquakes, and then the stimulation ends, we kind of get this sort of more uh, aftershock decay. We don't always see aftershocks in our dog fracturing, um, but in this case, we do. And so I hope, hope this kind of demonstrates why we can, we can now see it a lot, a lot easier and we be more convinced. So these techniques are also ideally suited for injection induced seismicity because injection induced seismicity tends to occur as swarms. So by swarms, I mean that we have uh, often hundreds or thousands of repeating similar events within a relative, relatively short time period. Right? Um, so because these events detect repeating events, right, we can learn a lot more about these sequences and characterize them quite well. So, so we're quite fortunate in, in that regard. So in addition to being able to detect these earthquakes better, um, we also have better uh, industry records. Now, in the United States, the, the hydraulic fracturing uh, public disclosure, disclosure is still uh, very poor, but it is much better than it was five years ago. Um, so in the United States, uh, most of my research into hydraulic fracturing relies actually on a chemical repository. Right? So this is a database that industry will go and report the chemicals to be used in their hydraulic simulations. So this database is not intended to be used to <laughs> look for induced seismicity. But in, in, in almost all the cases, like, this is the only publicly available source of information that includes the approximate date and time of these stimulations. So this database now has over 150,000 walls. Um, they first started in 2011, and it's grown quite a lot. And during this time period, um, some states have made um, it mandatory that the operator report the chemicals um, during this time. Now, although it's mandatory, it does not mean the catalog is complete. Uh, for example, in Oklahoma, even after the regulations went into effect that the operators had to report these chemicals, we still found about 8% of wells uh, were not reported. So we certainly know this, this uh, database is incomplete. Um, we also know that there are some issues with, with this database. So here's an example of, of one of the, the chemical reports. And so this, at the top here of this, of this PDF, we'll have some well meta metadata, and below that will be a big list of all the chemicals we use. Um, we do think that uh, the the type of frac fluid can have some influence over um, the seismicity, uh, predominantly whether it's a, a, a fluid or a, a gel-based uh, frac um, profit. Um, but for, at least at this very start, we're primarily interested in this well metadata. Because this is what contains the latitude, longitude, and, and timing of the well. Now, if we look at this case, uh, we'll see that this has a reported fracture date of June 8th, 2021. Um, so this means that either this operator has invented time travel or they weren't very careful when they reported this well. Right, so this is an example of a critical error. But because we need to have the, the timing and location of this well, uh, we cannot use. Now, we're, we're still kind of fortunate in this case that this well was reported in the future, right? So we can, we can discard this well. Uh, but this is a significant issue when dealing with wells um, um, that have more reasonable dates. So these issues are not fun to deal with. Um, but there are some issues that, that are fun to deal with. Um, I particularly like enjoy, <laughs> enjoy looking at uh, the creative ways that industry has come up to spell state names. Uh, Pennsylvania seems to be a, a real trouble. trouble. Uh, but my, my absolute favorite spelling of Pennsylvania has got to be uh, Pennsylvania. You know, I kind of hope the, the author speaks like they type it's in my mind. Uh, I think it's pretty fun. So th these are, you know, obviously this does not influence my results at all. And as long as I have accurate latitudes and longitudes, I can determine the states myself. This kind of raises the question, right? If the operator is not careful enough to type the state that they live in correctly, like what does this say about the latitudes and longitudes? As I showed previously, you know, there's, there's issues with the, the timings of these wells. And so, so we know this is an incomplete, inaccurate data set, but it's the best that we have in many cases. 
Now, sort of the, the gold standard uh, uh, of data that we would like to have is the stimulation report. Um, so this is a, sort of a, an account of what occurred at the well on a minute resolution. This includes the volumes, the pressures, um, the rates that were ejected, also a description of what was occurring um, at each, each, each time step. Um, these these uh, stimulation reports tend to also occur some, uh, include some kind of uh, graph of, of pressure over time. Um, so these uh, are very, very valuable, um, but we ha only have these for a handful of cases. Now, these uh, stimulation reports are produced from every well that is stimulated. Right? So the operators have this information, um, just in many cases, they're not required to disclose it. Now, in some cases, we do have this, these STEM reports, and we can do a lot of science with them. I'd like to run just through a, a couple examples of that. So this is a case in Ohio. So this is a map view. Uh, these two black squares are the well pads. And these black lines are the horizontal laterals that were, that were drilled. Each one of these ovals corresponds to a simulation stage that was done. Now, the color of those stages corresponds to the relative timing. So this operator first started fracking uh, 5 and 6H, and there weren't any earthquakes. It wasn't until they started fracking 3H and they got to this more northern extent where the stars are that we saw earthquakes. There was then a gap in seismicity as the operator fracked 1 and 2H, and then as they reached the more northern extent again, um, seismicity came um, and they produced a magnitude 3. At this time, the regulator stepped in and shut down um, these wells. Now, with the STEM report, uh, we can observe that there's this really close spatial uh, correlation between the individual stimulations and the earthquakes. So I think with this information, um, someone could argue that this well over to the west could be a uh, safely hydraulically fracture um, if, if this distance um, um, component is true. And obviously, this operator would, should instigate some kind of seismic mitigation plan um, to reduce the likelihood. Um, but based off this evidence, uh, I would say that that, that well um, could be safely fractured. Um, another good uh, thing that we can do with this simulation report is start to look at the physical mechanisms that actually cause these earthquakes. Um, so this is actually an example from Oklahoma. Now, we actually don't have any stimulation reports for both Oklahoma or Texas, right? but I was able to get this, these injection rates from an open file report. Um, so you're looking at all the injection data that we have for both Oklahoma and Texas um, in this top plot here. Right? What we can do is we can look at that injection rate and compare it to the earth that we saw. We can look at the, kind of the decay following each stimulation and for that um, those activities. We can also start to model um, the, the seismicity. We can look at the poor elastic and poor pressure um, influences that the, that well had um, on the seismicity and start to understand what's actually the driving mechanism that's responsible for these events. Right. But again, in these cases, we need to have those stimulation reports, and in most cases, uh, we don't have those data. Now, up in Canada, um, they've uh, really led the game in terms of collaborating between industry and, and academia. So this is a really great study done by Dave Eaton and others that's published last year. Um, so this is done in collaboration, collaboration with Chevron. So this figure on the left is, is a map view of, of these horizontal laterals that are built and how these three lines. And each one of these blue triangles represents a shallow borehole seismometer. Right? So they have about 70 or so instruments within a few kilometers of the stimulation. Um, so for, for reference, you know, I consider myself very fortunate when I have one good station within 50 kilometers. These guys have 70 within a few kilometers. So on the one, on the figure on the right uh, shows a zoomed in version of this well. It shows the 4,000 or so uh, micro seismic events they've been identified um, up to magnitude 3.2. Uh, so I believe that at some point down the line, um, all these data will become uh, publicly available, which I think will be a great next set to use. Um, now in the United States, um, I'm not aware of any collaborations with industry um, on this kind of scale. And I realize how kind of funny that is. Uh, considering I, I'm making things worse in this presentation by teasing industry about, about their typos. Um, but on a more serious note, um, um, I think communication with industry, at least in terms of hydraulic fracturing, has never been as good as it is now. We form some really good uh, uh, pathways with industry. You know, they're always interested in, in hearing what we, what we found, what we've done. Um, industry is, is just as eager to solve this problem of, of the uses of as, as we are. Um, you know, just when it term, comes, term, uh, comes time to collaborate, um, there are certain liability, public perception, and monetary challenges um, that, that we still have to address. Uh, but I'm, I'm an optimist, and uh, hopefully down the line uh, we can get some, some collaborations going. We have had some data exchanges, uh, but they've been relatively limited um, in scope uh, to me. Um, so the final uh, reason why we, we've seen more cases that, is that we're actually looking for hydraulic pressure in these results. So I think there was kind of a time period where we didn't really know it was occurring to the extent that it actually was, so we didn't really look for it. Um, I think we've kind of moved past this point now. We, we certainly know how to make it happen. 
Uh, we know what it looks like, and we're getting a lot better at identifying it. So hopefully with this, um, we can start to learn more about it and reduce the, the, the likelihood of these events and reduce the hazard um, in the future. I think a really good example of this issue of we're not really looking for it what was in Oklahoma. So previously, there were there were two published cases of hydraulic fracturing due to heat, uh, one by Austin Holland um, with magnitude section 2.9, and another by uh, Amberly Barrel and others uh, with magnitude section 2.2. Both of these cases occurred in, in southern Oklahoma. Now, we wanted to uh, look at seismicity uh, throughout the entire state. Um, we, we knew that wastewater disposal is the primary driver of induced seismicity. We also wanted to determine you know, what percentage of these earthquakes are induced by hydraulic fracturing and is there kind of any, any hazard associated with those in the state. So, we first wanted to improve the catalog in, in Oklahoma. So, we took all the catalog events done by the, the OGS, the, sorry, the Oklahoma Geological Survey and the Compact Catalogs. We took all those catalog events and ran it through a large scale submission routine. We turned those 20,000 or so earthquakes into about a quarter of a million earthquakes. Now with these quarter of a million earthquakes, I then gathered the 10,000 or so reported stimulated wells um, at the time. And I tried to merge these two data sets together. Now if I was a professor at a university, um, <laughs> you know, someone like that might just get an army of undergrads together and, and just you know, sift through all that data. Um, but I'm just a lowly post postdoc, right? I had to come up with a more uh, intelligent solution to that, that problem. Um, so to do this, I wanted to, to quantitatively sort these 10,000 or so stimulated wells based off the likelihood that they induced earthquakes. So to do this, I made an assumption. An assumption was that if a stimulated well induced earthquakes, that there would be more earthquakes during the stimulation than the time period before or after. And that assumption is kind of related um, in this uh, but, but in English, what we pretty much did is we took the earthquake rate during hydraulic fracturing and divided the earthquake rate in the time period before and, and after. And to do this, we looked at various distance ranges away from the well and different time windows. And we stacked all those, those uh, uh, numerical values together to produce one final value that we could then sort by. So I should note that um, you know, we looked out uh, 10 kilometers from a well and incorporated all the, the earthquakes from those distances. Although it looks 10 kilometers out, um, I think it's very unlikely um, to induce earthquakes from hydraulic fracturing at those distances. Um, the model that we've done suggests that earthquakes tend to be um, within a few kilometers of the well. Um, but in Oklahoma, especially early on in the catalog, we had significant issues with um, um, uncertainty in locations. Right? So with this, we could still consider earthquakes that were poorly located, but it creates an intrinsic bias towards earthquakes that are well located um, close to proximity to the well. So this method actually turned out to work really well um, for our data set. Um, so here's some examples. Um, so this shows uh, earthquakes within a five kilometer area of Oklahoma. This top plot shows magnitude over time. This bottom plot shows the cumulative number of events over time. And this shows about a year and a half of data. So if we look at the earthquakes, we see that they occur in these very tight Tabora clusters. But this is a characteristic of hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity. And sure enough, if we plot the time periods of hydraulic fracturing shown by these red bars, he said there's a really good agreement between the seismicity and, and these wells. So we can zoom in on one of these cases. You can see that you know, it's nice and quiet beforehand when they start um, hydraulically stimulating. You get earthquakes, they stop, and the earthquakes stop. So this well was uh, flagged as potentially being um, um, inducing a seismicity. And in fact, um, all these cases in this example uh, were flagged with the exception of this first case. So if you look at this first case, the earthquakes actually start a day or two before the stimulation was reported to have begun. Now, I'm not much of a betting man, right? But I would be willing to put a sizable amount of money down that says that this operator um, misreported the timings of other simulation, which is a significant issue. But because we don't have any data to, to you know, corroborate my, my suspicion, right, we have to assume that this reported data is accurate. Um, so this well was not flagged as having used your space. Okay, so this is a very small five kilometer area. I'm not gonna kind of zoom out on a statewide scale and, and try to describe what we found. So each one of these boxes that I drew are areas that we found that have you know, very substantial amounts of hydraulic fracturing and seismicity. So these red boxes are the regions that are highlighted on the right. Um, depending on, on your monitor size, you may not be able to see the detail. Uh, but in general, these all show that kind of light switch approach where the earthquakes turn on and they turn off. And they're all coincident spatially um, with, with hydraulic fracturing as well. Okay. Um, so you might notice that we didn't identify any cases in this big seismicity blob um, of, of kind of northern central Oklahoma. So this is where a lot of the high volume, high rate wastewater disposal wells are. 
So a lot of these earthquakes are used by wastewater disposal. Well, because there's so many earthquakes in this area for most of our disposal, we weren't able to identify statistically significant changes in the earthquake rate that coincided with um, the simulations. But keep in mind, we just have a start day and end day. I think if we had uh, um, sort of the stem reports, we had a minute resolution, we could draw uh, significant correlations, uh, but we don't have that, um, those data um, in Oklahoma. And so as a result, uh, we couldn't identify any events confidently um, in this data set. Uh, there are some uh, suspicious cases where uh, there may be some magnitude floors um, that were used by drought fracturing in this in this blob. Uh, based off the the geology and industrial parameters that we know about, um, we would suspect that there are cases of hydraulic fracturing in this area because they're covered up by the, the wastewater disposal system. So to try to summarize um, all these re regions, um, I try to make this bigger. Right? So each one of these these regions is represented by one of these lines, and the lines represent the percentage of earthquakes in that area that we associated with hydraulic fracturing. So a lot of these regions, um, you know, virtually all the earthquakes we could associate with an individual hydraulic fracture wall, which is pretty remarkable considering, you know, the limitations of our data. And, um, so these numbers in parentheses represent the number of earthquakes that we identified. Um, so you know, hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity in Oklahoma is is not a negligible thing. Um, okay. Um, so in summary, of the cases that we're very confident about. Uh, we identified uh, over 270 cases of hydraulic fracturing and use as um, All these cases of the ones that we're confident about, the largest magnitude was a 3.5 um, in these figures. Um, since these figures were made, we've now identified larger magnitude events um, up to about 3.7%. So uh, um, relatively recently, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission um, implemented some regulations that target the scoop and stack. Um, so the scoop and stack is this polygon drawn here. Drawn here. Um, so for those that don't know, don't know uh, SCOOP stands for the South Central Oklahoma Oil Province, while STAC stands for the Senior Trend Oil Field, the Anadarko Basin, and the Canadian and Kingfisher Counties. And I thought the USGS had some bad acronyms, but you know industry has a SCOOP in this case. Uh, but <laughs> the SCOOP and STAC is shown here. So these regulations that are imposed only target the SCOOP and STAC. Right? So there's these cases of hydraulic fracturing is just um, um, outside this region. Presumably, if there are other cases in the future, they would not be um, uh, under these regulations. So the regulations imposed by the, the Corporation Commission um, are as follows. If there's a, a earthquake within a, a five kilometers that's below magnitude two, the operator is not required to take any steps. Um, if there's an earthquake uh, that's greater than magnitude two, they have to implement a predetermined mitigation plan. If an earthquake is larger than magnitude three, the operator has to pause the operations for a few hours. And if there's a magnitude larger than 3.5, the operator has to, has to uh, suspend their operations and wait for uh, approval to resume operations. So this is kind of uh, referred to as a stoplight um, regulation, in that you know, if it's less than magnitude 2, it's pretty light and continue as normal. Um, although that's what the regulation state says, um, that the industry should still be considering every earthquake that is induced as a data point. Um, at least to me, there's a huge difference between a magnitude 1.9 that's induced and not inducing anything. As I showed in my previous example, if you start identifying those earthquakes early, and you start to map where those faults are and which simulations can induce the earthquakes, you can take steps to reduce the likelihood um, of inducing um, large magnitude earthquakes, and hopefully the operator will, will never have to um, 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 run into those, those um, yellow or red lights. Okay, now I'd like to kind of uh, jump overseas to China and talk about that recent 4.9 that occurred. So this is work uh, that is done by uh, Wenzhuang Meng. Uh, she was a visiting scholar here at the USGS last year. Um, she has returned to her job at the, the China Earthquake Network Center, Network Center um, just in time for this earthquake. Um, so uh, the Chinese government has put restrictions on what can be publicly presented, um, but I did get a thumbs up um, to show uh, this, this overview figure uh, that Wenzhuang Meng made. Um, so the Sichuan Basin is, is in the central uh, part of China. It's been going under, undergoing um, some very substantial uh, developments of, of, um, of unconventionals. Well, if you look in this area, um, there have been no uh, reports of magnitude 5, um, even in, in historical time, going back to 500 AD. Um, so th there haven't been um, earthquakes of this magnitude in, in that area. Uh, if you look at the, the magnitude 3s and larger in this area, uh, we see that it, it kind of started taking off in 2015, but especially in the past year or so, um, the, the seismicity rate has, has dramatically increased. If we look at all earthquakes greater than magnitude zero, again, the catalog is not complete for this entire time frame. This is just all earthquakes in the catalog. Um, most of the earthquakes um, have been identified in the past uh, few years. 
So total we've identified over 10,000 earthquakes um, in this, this uh, area. Now at the time of, of this 4.9, there were 10 well pads that were either in process being drilled or were actively being hydraulically stimulated. Um, so the stimulation depth was about three and a half kilometers, which is about a kilometer deeper than that uh, stimulation that caused the 4.7 on a few years ago. As a result of, of, of these earthquakes, uh, left two dead, um, 13 wounded, um, over 20,000 homes were damaged, and uh, 1,600 people are now living in um, of tents in temporary housing. So the day after the 4.9, uh, the operator was still uh, <laughs> fracking away. Um, the local government then had to step in and, and uh, uh, cease the operations um, at these wells. So a big question in my mind is, you know, why has China had these, these, these largest um, induced cases? And in terms of the geology, um, there's really nothing that jumps out that makes this basin unique from the other cases in, in um, Canada um, or the United States, at least at, at a cursory glance. Um, I do think that there could be differences on the operator level. Right? For example, that, that after the operator caused the 4.9, right, they, they were still uh, chugging away, right? They, they, <laughs> they didn't really seem to uh, be influenced by that seismicity. Um, I think this is really highlighted um, in a, a, a New York Times article that was, that was written about this earthquake. Um, so uh, this, this uh, reporter uh, contacted the oil companies um, that were active in this area. And of course, um, many of them didn't, didn't want to comment. Um, but the subsidiary for the, the China National Petroleum Company uh, did write a blog post that said the suspension of these wells was unnecessary. So the big point is, you know, compared, they said that compared to the economic loss of this, of this development, the seismicity um, caused by this drilling was a lesser of two evils. Well, at least from an American perspective, this is this is quite the thing to say. Considering you know, two people had died and millions of damage, millions of dollars of damage had occurred. Um, so I, I, I again, I, this is pure speculation, but I'm, I'm guessing that this operator did not have a seismicity mitigation plan um, in effect. Um, did not seem um, um, to be that concerned about seismicity. Um, so, so I think that is, at least in my opinion, um, the, the more significant factor that controls um, these magnitudes um, in China. So I've been talking a lot about hydraulic fracturing um, in these earthquakes in terms of, of uh, hydrocarbons, um, but we also hydraulically fracture a wide variety of different types of wells. So pretty much any time we want to increase the permeability in the subsurface, uh, we turn to hydraulic fracturing. So a big uh, kind of up and coming uh, uh, technology source for energy um, is called enhanced geothermal systems. So the idea with this is that we can drill a well uh, almost anywhere, hydraulically uh, stimulate the, the interval, and then we can start pumping in water um, and then we extract the hot water, right? So, you know, if this technology, you know, catches off, uh, take, uh, takes off, we can essentially drill uh, geothermal wells uh, almost anywhere. Now, most of these wells are targeting, you know, the deep um, sedimentary layers or even the, the basement itself, where it's nice and warm. Um, and yes, I, I did say previously that we should be avoiding the basement. Um, one can really get the, the hazard. Um, so with these, these EGS um, wells, we would expect an increased uh, seismic hazard. Now, there have been, ha there have been a couple of cases um, um, of induced seismicity um, caused by EGS. Um, there's a case in, in, in Basel, Switzerland um, in 2006 that caused a magnitude 3.4. This has been a very well studied uh, uh, sequence, and there's still actually earthquakes going on today, um, just kind of below magnitude 1 level. More recently, there was a magnitude 5.5 um, that was induced in, in Pohang, South Korea. Um, this is the most damaging earthquake um, that's occurred in, in centuries in South Korea. There were a couple of science articles that were written about it last year. And actually just last week, uh, a team, an uh, expert team that was put together by the Korean government um, concluded that this was in fact induced by this, this EGS well. Now, uh, not all cases of EGS have, have been so-called failures. Right? We have done it successfully, both in, in France and the United States in the past, just on a relatively small scale. There has been a, a, a pretty promising case of, of EGS in Finland. Um, they implemented a real-time traffic light system um, where they, they've uh, changed the injection rates and uh, volumes in response to the seismicity that they identified in real time. And as, as a result of that traffic light system, they were able to keep the seismicity below the red light um, of magnitude 2. Right? So they successfully simulated well, and it should be increasing energy from that in the future. Now in the United States, there's been a big initiative um, from the Department of Energy um, called the, the FORGE initiative. So here's another acronym. Uh, FORGE stands for the Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. Um, so they've selected a site in, in Utah where they'll be doing uh, this EGS uh, system. Um, in terms of the risk, uh, this is a, a pretty low risk area because it's very sparsely populated and the DOE is, is being very careful about induced seismicity. 
Um, so this should be a really great data set um, of going forward um, when this card comes to me. So if, if you don't think I've speculated enough in this, <laughs> this presentation, uh, this slide is for you. Um, I'm kind of just looking at the crystal ball and kind of guessing what, uh, what I would expect uh, would occur in the future based off what I've seen in the past. Um, so all evidence suggests that hydraulic fracturing inducement fix will still occur. I think we've gotten a little bit better at, at understanding this and mitigating the hazard, um, but, but we still uh, certainly will be inducing this fix as long as we um, hydraulic fracture. So kind of just qualitatively sorted the, the different regions based off uh, the likelihood uh, that uh, they might uh, induce a hazardous event. Uh, based off China's past, I think that, that this will remain the most hazardous area. Um, Canada, um, they've had a history of the, those mid 1940s, including a 4.5 as recent as, as past November. Right? So they still have some, some other substantial events. In the United States, um, I didn't talk about it um, at all in this presentation, but there's the Permian Basin in Texas. Um, I kind of call this a, a baby Oklahoma. Um, it's quite not at that extent yet, um, but there is a, quite a bit of induced seismicity um, that is starting to take off with uh, development of, of the oil field there. Um, so we're hoping to get uh, a, a really jump on this and hopefully we can mitigate some of the seismicity um, before it reaches Oklahoma. Levels. In Oklahoma, um, again, I talked about those regulation, regulations in the scoop and stack, um, which will hopefully uh, uh, keep some of these, these magnitudes uh, quite low. Um, but I do know that the industry is, is planning to extensively develop these, these areas. Um, because we see these, these uh, areas of Oklahoma that have you know, quite a bit of hydraulic traction and use earthquakes, um, um, we probably will see some more cases in this weekend stack. Um, you know, just for reference, right, a, a majority of some of those uh, standard wells in those counties induce earthquakes. So when you're drilling a well next to those cases, um, you know, I think the likelihood is, is, is quite high that those would also induce earthquakes. Um, the Appalachian Basin, I talked about that just very briefly at the beginning. Um, the magnitudes have been, been quite small, um, but we do have ongoing systems to there from hydraulic fraction. Um, in terms of, of actually understanding the mechanisms responsible for induced seismicity, I think Canada will, will likely be leading this effort um, due to those, those collaborations that they've built between the regulators, academia, and, and industry. Um, but hopefully we can duplicate what Canada has done um, here in the States and start to, to really start understanding um, what's occurring uh, down here. And finally, uh, the enhanced geothermal systems, I'm kind of leaving that as a question mark. It really depends on whether or not this technology takes off in the next decade or so. Um, but it does have some potential for, for inducing some, some earthquakes. So that'll be need to be a, a careful study. So in conclusion, um, so wastewater disposal is certainly the primary contributor to the, the induced seismicity hazard in the central and eastern United States. Um, but hopefully I've, I've shown that hydraulic fraction induced seismicity is, is now more prominent both in the United States and around the world um, over the past five years. So depending on where you are in the world, whether it's Canada or, or China, um, hydraulic fracturing could be the, the primary cause for the, the induced seismicity hazard. So while the chances that a, a hydraulic fracture well on a kind of global scale is relatively low, or even on a basin scale, maybe only a few percent of wells might induce earthquakes, on the kind of county scale, the, the occurrence can be much higher with more than 50% of, of wells being stimulated on using earthquakes. And so I think that, I, I don't think we really expected that about, about five years ago. So today, the largest earthquake that we suspect to be induced by hydraulic fracture was about to 4.9. Um, but quite a portion in the United States, um, at least we have not confidently identified any cases of magnitude 4 um, seismicity um, induced by hydraulic fracture. Um, in the past, we can't exclude that possibility. Again, there's that big seismicity cloud in Oklahoma that kind of obscures things. And we also can't outrule the, uh, the, the possibility of inducing magnitude 4 in the future. But hopefully, with these regulations and increased understanding, um, we can really reduce that the mitigation. So, uh, in this uh, presentation, I hope, hope you all learned something. Hope you found this topic as interesting as I do. Um, if you have any complaints, uh, you can e email them to uh, Justin Rubenstein. His email is jrubenstein. <laughs> I'm kidding, Justin. Uh, but with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions um, or take any complaints. Thanks a lot. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. Your research is totally fascinating. And uh, reflecting that, we have a whole series of really good questions. So the first question is from Rashid, uh, and they would like to know what is B value? So, yeah, B value is a relationship between the, the magnitudes that occur, right? So if the B value is very high, you tend to have more smaller magnitude events than larger magnitude events, right? So this is a, a very common law in seismology um, that was identified by Gutenberg and Richter, where they looked at seismicity throughout the entire world. And they pretty much found that, for example, let's say there's a magnitude seven, 
if there's a magnitude seven, that would mean that there would be 10 magnitude sixes. If there are 10 magnitude sixes, it'd be 100 magnitude fives, right? So it follows this, this logarithmic pattern. That's, that's, in my opinion, it's the most beautiful, beautiful scientific relationship that we found um, that works really well in these, these global type, type scales. Um, when it comes to individual sequences, we can use that relationship to, to kind of describe the distribution of magnitudes in those cases. So when it comes to the stimulations, uh, the, the microseismicity, um, those microseismic events are limited by the size of the fractures, right? Those fractures are relatively small, so they can't produce seismicity that's greater than magnitude one. Right? As a result, they kind of have a, a greater uh, propensity to produce these very small magnitude events. In those cases, we would say that the B value is high, around two. But the global relationship is that they have this, this B value of one. Good answer, thank you. Okay, the next uh, question is from Christine, and they would like to know, uh, how are you able to differentiate between HF-induced earthquakes versus wastewater-induced earthquakes, especially when they're near each other? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So like in Ohio, it's actually really easy to distinguish the two because hydraulic fracturing tends to be uh, far away from wastewater disposal. Um, like even in Oklahoma, it's, it's, it's a real challenge, right? Because hydraulic fracturing tends to be very short-lived, right? It's, it's one of the characteristics that we can identify, right? So wastewater also tends to produce this more long-lived um, uh, induced sequences. It, you can kind of think of it, of it as, uh, think about the time histories of injection. For hydraulic fracturing, they're only stimulating for a few days or a few weeks, but for wastewater disposal, they're injecting often for, for months or years. Right? So you get more long-lived um, wastewater disposal induced sequences. But hydraulic fracturing, they tend to be relatively short-lived on kind of the time scale of, of, of weeks. Um, so that's, that's really the primary characteristic that we look for. Um, that, that kind of spatial temporal correlation with individual frac stages. Um, it definitely helps in Oklahoma. You know, when we have a lot of cases that are close by, um, it kind of, you know, increases the likelihood that, that they're induced, right? It's, the chances that each one of these kind of light switches correlates with a well, um, you know, chances that all of these correlate is, is relatively low. Right? An individual sequence, maybe it's, it's arguable, um, but because we all these sequences in that area that all induce hydraulic fracturing, that's really the large um, um, factor that we're looking for. That makes sense. All right, the next question is from Siddharth, and uh, they would like to know, how soon do the well operators have to report stimulation? Is it before it occurs, or how soon after it occurs? So in, in terms of this chemical repository, um, it, the, the regulation varies depending on, on the state. So again, some states don't require that that information is ever disclosed. In some states, I think it's on the order of a few months. Um, but there are cases where we've seen wells added, you know, multiple years later. Um, so it, 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 it really depends, but it, it should be within a few months, all in stimulation, um, that the operator should uh, contribute those chemical reports. Right, so hopefully a few months. A few months, hopefully, yes. Okay, uh, the next question, is there a type of earthquake, strike, slip, et cetera, that occurs more often from induced seismicity? That's a great question, right? So in Oklahoma, it's predominantly strike, slip, um, induced earthquakes. Um, and so I mentioned before, these earthquakes tend to occur in the basement. Um, so it's really hard to identify these faults prior to causing seismicity, right? So these are strike, slip faults with very little, very little vertical offset. So even in areas where we have active seismic, where we have the potential to identify these faults, because we don't see that offset, we can't identify these faults until after we cause the earthquakes. Um, but in, in, in general, most of the induced earthquakes um, in the United States uh, are strike slip. Um, in China, that those hydraulic fraction earthquakes were a combination of strike slip and reverse, uh, but, that is, but pre predominantly strike slip in the United States. That's interesting, I didn't know that. Uh, all right, so Denise would like to know, in Oklahoma, are the mitigation plans made public? The yeah, so, so these re regulations that I presented, um, nice. these regulations are, are public, right? They, they announced this, they did some, some media um, you know, describing what, what is going on. Um, these efforts are, are public. Now, kind of the issue is that the regulation does not state that the results of these regulations have to be made public. For example, if a operator causes magnitude 3.5 and the well is shut down, the operator nor the Corporation Commission has to uh, announce that. Right? So for that reason, um, I think uh, public research into hydraulic fracturing and uh, should continue um, in the scooping staff. All right, 
Uh, Pin Chang would like to know why earthquakes associated with hydraulic fracturing in the Sichuan Basin are so large in magnitude. Yeah, so I, I try to uh, <laughs> speculate as, as to why. Um, we really don't know the industrial parameters um, um, that are behind this. We, we don't have any of the pressures or, or volumes. Um, maybe as a result of this case, because you know people had died and this, this has created a, a bit of unrest in China, um, that maybe there'll be more pressure push push onto the, onto this operator to to, declo- to disclose that that uh, those data so that the science can be done. Um, but in general, we we really don't know. Um, I've, I've looked at the geology of this area, and it's I mean obviously it's it's susceptible to it um, based off all the parameters that we know, um, but there's nothing that really jumps out that says this area should have these large magnitude events um, beyond that potential for the, the operator. Right? But, but again, that, that is just speculation on my part. Um, we really just don't know at this point. All right, thank you. Uh, so both William and Nadine would like to congratulate you on a great talk and thank you for that. So I'll pass that along. Oh, thank uh, you. And William has a question. He says, I believe there's been intense HF activity in Russia I don't know how to say this, Bosenhov Formation, Western Siberian Basin, uh, any literature from induced events? Ooh, I, I am not familiar with, is, with what is occurring in, in Russia. Um, I can definitely take a look at that, uh, but I am not aware of, of any cases in my mind. But yeah, I, uh, that's, that's a good note. I'll, I'll write it down to, to look into it. All right, a new, a new project to start. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I don't have enough work to do, for sure. All right, the next question, does the increased hazard arrow indicate China has the most hazard and the U.S. the lowest hazard? Um, I think in the United States, uh, I mean, that, that's really tough to say. Um, certainly in the United States, um, there are states that have implemented regulations. Uh, for example, Ohio has some, some relatively strict regulations, so the kind of the, the red light is, is, is lower than magnitude 3.5. Uh, in the U.K., the red light is, is magnitude 0.5. Right, so extremely low. That is, that's pretty much the reason why uh, they're not stimulating many wells in, in the UK. Um, um, I think I forgot the question, but in the United States, yeah, there's, we don't really know why we don't have magnitude fours. Uh, we certainly have the potential to induce magnitude fours. Um, all the, the, the parameters are there, but it could be that, that the operators are a little more cautious and they're actually monitoring for these events, and that they're, you know, they're 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 implementing mitigation plans. They're they're skipping stimulation stages when they think they induced earthquakes. They're reducing volumes and pressures. They may switch from from you know a water-based frac coffin to a gel-based coffin. Um, you know, there's <laughs> there's a lot of that we don't know based on the operational parameters. Um, yeah. But based purely on the geology, we don't know. So. All right. Uh, Jonathan would like to know what your thoughts are on the five low magnitude earthquakes that recently occurred in North Florida. Yes, uh, so uh, the USGS is is taking a look at that. Um, I, I believe that uh, some people have been sent out to deploy some, some instruments in that area. Um, there were some some concerns uh, from the, the state of Florida that that these might be induced. Um, uh, it has a potential. Right, there was a study that was done. Oh, was it? The 90s that that suspected that there could have been some earthquakes associated with extraction of fluids in that area. Um, we do not know that there are some uh, uh, there's some uh, disposal uh, uh, wells in that area, but in terms of, of characterizing whether these are induced or natural, um, I don't think we've, we've reached that conclusion yet. But we are definitely looking at that. Be interesting to see what uh, comes out of those studies. Definitely. Uh, Farrah would like to know, what is the accuracy of depth distribution of events you considered in your analysis? Sure, yeah. I mean, so I, I talked about quite a bit of different things uh, throughout the United States. Um, the depths, depths do, do vary. Um, yeah, so in, in Oklahoma, um, especially early on in the catalog, the depth uh, constraints are not very good. Um, the errors on the order of a, of a few kilometers. Um, but later on, we, you know, we're, we're certainly confident that the majority of these events are are in the basement. Um, so we have done some relocated catalogs um, of these events, and they're they're kind of in the, the upper Precambrian basement, kind of within a a, ba- a a kilometer or so of that that basement basement level. Um, but yeah, and, and we're confident enough to say that these are in the basement, um, but there certainly is some uncertainty with that. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Luis would like to know, in terms of regulation, why use local magnitude instead of moment magnitude? <laughs> that's yeah. That's a tough question. Um, big point is that there are 
you know, a, a many different ways to calculate magnitudes. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult to estimate moment magnitudes on the fly, um, whereas local magnitudes, you can calculate those relatively quickly. Um, so this has been a, kind of a criticism, especially up in, in, in Canada, um, of, you know, depending on how you calculate those magnitudes, right, the things vary. Um, so that, that is purely a, a regulation standpoint. Um, we could calculate moment magnitudes, just that that is more difficult to do. Um, but I'm not really aware of any reason uh, beyond that difficulty that we're not doing that. Okay. Uh, the next question, where does the September 3rd, uh, 2016 magnitude 5.8 earthquake in Oklahoma fall within the big picture? Are there any mitigation measures in place since this event? Yes, so that 5.8 occurred in, in Pawnee. That's kind of like northeastern um, part of, this, of the Sesame Street cluster. Um, so that was caused by wastewater disposal, not hydraulic fracture. Um, but as a response from that, um, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission um, implemented a uh, moratorium. So within this area, they, they shut down those, those injection wells. Um, that most of that injection has, has moved elsewhere, right? um, but they have reduced the volumes um, in that area around that, that Pawnee magnitude 5.8 earthquake. Um, since then, seismic has been relatively low, um, so I think that, that mitigation um, has, has been a success in that area. Um, but the issue is that you know this volume is still being injected elsewhere, right? So it's not being injected right near that fault, but it is probably causing earthquakes elsewhere um, in the state. Right. All right. So uh, many. Uh, magnitude less than one HF induced earthquakes were identified. Can simple hydrofracts cause a characteristic earthquake template? Can hydro yeah, so uh, microseismic, it obviously it does produce a, a seismic signal that, that can be observed. Um, for the cases that we identified, right, these were catalog cases that were larger than magnitude three. Right? So, base, so when we identify those smaller magnitude events, we're looking that for waveforms that are very similar to that catalog event. Very similar to that catalog waveform. Right? So the events that we identified are, are in very close spatial proximity to that, that original catalog event. So because this catalog um, is predominantly basement based uh, um, seismicity, um, we're identifying more seismicity that's occurring in the basement. Um, so in a lot of the cases, um, they, it is kind of at the magnitude one level, but, but these have that distance separation between the interval that's being stimulated and where the earthquakes are actually occurring. Um, we've also looked at those, those, as I mentioned before, those, those B values. Those are all typical uh, B value one. Um, so we're quite confident that we're not identifying micro seismicity, but we're identifying hydraulic fracture. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, Do you think the reason of hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity in the basement is mostly mechanical due to stress, uh, tr stress transfer along a through going fault, or is it due to fluid transport and pressure diffusion along the fault? So we've had that, we have done some modeling into this, um, looking at both the, the poor fluid pressure diffusion as well as, well, as well as the poor elastic effects. And we actually think poor elastic effects um, are likely the, the dominant cause for most of these, these induced earthquakes. Um, so kind of the main reason for that is that we see earthquakes start almost immediately following the start of a stimulation, right? But these earthquakes are you know, a kilometer away and there's really no way for that actual poor fluid pressure to diffuse that quickly um, over those distances. Whereas poor elastic effects, uh, those you know, theoretically travel at the speed of sound, right? So, so those um, um, have certainly induced cases. Um, we're not ruling out poor pressure um, from a drop fracture induced seismicity. We, we do think there are still cases that poor fluid pressure is, is very important for inducing cases. Um, when it comes to uh, the basement, um, you know, the, the key metric there is, is not really the basement, but rather the proximity to the fault. Right? So when we did that study, um, looking at proximity to the basement. Um, the motivation for that was that we knew that most of the seismicity was occurring in the basement. We knew that this, this pre cambric basement is a you know, billion years old. It's highly fractured. Um, it, it's certainly critically stressed. Um, um, so we think that the proximity to that basement, we use that as a proxy. Right? But the, the key metric here is proximity to the fault. Um, but the problem is that proximity to fault is not something that can be observationally tested in the field, at least not practically. Um, so we needed to create some kind of proxy. Um, this also turned out to be um, very useful for the industry. But telling the industry to avoid unmapped faults you know, isn't useful, right? They don't know where their faults are. Right? But if we can tell them that, hey, if you're closer to the basement, you have a greater likelihood of using earthquakes, um, that, that's a lot more useful for them. Um, so when it comes to the likelihood, um, we really, really just think it's proximity to that, to that fault. 
um, because the, those stress changes are more significant within those distances. That's a very common sense answer. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. <laughs> Uh, the next question is from Yuri, uh, and they would like to know uh, how we could prove that the big number of induced events is caused by hydraulic fracturing, but not by increased number of seismic monitoring stations usually installed around oil deposits. So, I mean, I had that exact idea in mind when I did my catalog, right? So, for this entire catalog, I used the same three stations. Okay? So, these three stations were regional, right? some of them were actually you know, 200 kilometers away from the seismicity. Like we were still able to identify earthquakes of magnitude one level. Right? So that, that really shows the power of this technique. Um, so this this is like kind of the baseline of, of the catalog, right? I think you could do a lot better um, if you use closer stations. Right? But we wanted to be consistent. We wanted to use the same number of stations throughout this entire time um, series, um, so we didn't bias the results. Um, but again, um, let me jump back to that that um, slide at the beginning. Sorry, scrolling all the way back. So our catalog in the central and east United States is complete at this magnitude 2.7 level for this entire time series. Right? So even though we added more stations, we can detect smaller magnitude events. Right? It's consistent for this entire time series. So this increase in earthquakes is, is not related to the number of seismometers. This is, this is a real occurrence that, that is happening. Right? There are now more earthquakes than there were in the past, for sure. Awesome. Okay, how are there so little earthquake data for Osage County in Oklahoma? I understand the OCC has no jurisdiction in their well data, but I find it hard to believe there are uh, no earthquakes occurring there. Uh, so so there, are, there are some, uh, so I think that's where Pawnee happened, was it in the OCC, right across the border. Um, so that's, uh, I believe that's uh, like an Indian territory. So uh, the, the EPA does not regulate those wells. They're regulated instead by um, a different body. Wait, no, sorry. sorry the, the state does not regulate those wells. EPA is a regulator for those wells. Um, so I think uh, we don't have the injection data um, um, as much for, for those wells um, in that county. But in general, we don't think they're, they're doing as much um, injection in that area as opposed to these, these other counties. Um, but yeah, the, the, in terms of the earthquakes, uh, there, there's no bias. Um, we can detect earthquakes um, from, from when, when they occur in, in that county. Ooh, this is a good question. Uh, are some of the seismicity clusters in Oklahoma aligned along clear geologic structures? And if yes, were those structures already known? I, I am happy you asked that because uh, <laughs> we have a study that's currently in revision. So I took that improved catalog um, that I showed previously and we re relocated that catalog. So we relocated this entire catalog of, of these you know, quarter of a million earthquakes. Um, and then using those earthquakes, I identified um, the faults, right? So I, I created this kind of machine learning approach that took that relocated catalog and identified all these faults in there. So this is really important because almost all of these earthquakes in Oklahoma, and actually almost all of these earthquakes have occurred along previously unmapped faults. Right? So what we're doing now is creating a more refined fault catalog based off the seismicity. Now, the, the actual goal <laughs> that we want to do eventually is to be able to identify these faults and advance the seismicity. We still think that this is a useful tool, being able to identify the, these faults um, and, and provide the information to the, to the regulator and to, to the industry so that they know where these faults are. But yes, these are these are these these certainly are occurring along um, faults that down in the basement, because it predominantly strikes the faults. Um, most of these structures are pretty actually small. They're small little um, ligaments that are occurring in that basement. Um, you know, I kind of operate under the assumption that the Precambrian basement is pretty much fractured everywhere. Um, and it's composed of all these little tiny ligaments. Um, so we think that those are the uh, um, faults that are being activated um, in these cases. Interesting. All right, so what will be the possible consequences of using CO2 rather than water? Will the induced seismicity be reduced or will it increase? Yeah, so actually uh, my, my first two years of my postdoc uh, were looking at carbon sequestration and seismicity um, in Illinois. Um, so it's it's a little little bit different in that CO2 is naturally buoyant. So it actually wants, wants to come back up to the surface. Um, so there's some concerns, there's, uh, there, there's some concerns that are unique to carbon sequestration in that we need to maintain uh, the integrity of the cap rock. Right? So the cap rock is a relatively impermeable layer, often a shale that is above that injection horizon for the CO2. And it's, it's very important that we maintain that integrity. 
Because you can imagine that if that integrity of that, that cap rock is compromised and there's a fracture, that CO2 could then leak out and come back up to the surface, which is not what we want. Um, um, so in, in Illinois, um, there's the carbon sequestration site in, in Decatur. Um, um, so this is where we've been actively looking. Um, so there has been some induced seismicity there, um, but uh, smaller than magnitude 1.2. Um, so this is an area that uh, the Department of Energy is, is very strictly regulating. Um, it actually has its own class, right? They're, they're class five wells um, that have all of these new regulations. Just because it's a new technology, and we're still learning about the, the, the migration of that, that carbon um, um, plume over time. Um, so yeah, th there's some different hazards and different concerns with that, um, but it absolutely still can induce earthquakes. Cool. All right, can monitoring B values provide insight about having a potential or damaging earthquake during stimulation? Yeah, so some people have been using that, like a kind of like a real-time um, B value. Um, uh, I actually wrote an entire paper all about B values and induced earthquakes, uh, but we ended up not submitting it because I started questioning um, some of the interpretations we made. Um, but yeah, B values, I think uh, some people uh, maybe rely on them a little bit too much. Right? The actual law is, is, is certainly applicable to like a very large catalog on kind of a global scale. It's uh, applicable to individual faults. When you start getting a fault network with different fault properties and you're incorporating magnitudes of all of those different faults, I think it, it becomes kind of muddy. Um, so absolutely, people are still um, um, using those those uh, B values in a real-time sense to hopefully mitigate the seismicity. Um, I would be a little bit skeptical. Right? You should not rely solely on the B value. Um, but yeah, I think you could use that to, to help inform your decisions going forward. The devil's always in the details. <laughs> of course. All right, this is our last question. So beyond the magnitude, how to evaluate the expected shaking potential of earthquakes induced by hydraulic fracturing treatments? Wow, that's another great question because that's another project I'm working on. Right? Um, so we're looking at, <laughs> we set at it ground up for motion. You, no? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you guys are great. I wish you could review my papers. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're currently looking at that down in the Permian Basin. Right? So in general, induced seismicity tends to be quite shallow. Right? So I, I think I briefly mentioned that you know, people are actually feeling these magnitude twos. Right? You know, when I first started, we kind of just operated under this assumption that you know, kind of magnitude threes are kind of the threshold that are being felt. But because these events are so shallow and people are living right on top of them, right, these, these can become a new nuisance. nuisance. Um, so the ground motions, um, you know, Gail Atkinson has done some, some really great work um, looking at that. Um, so she did an, uh, an IRS webinar solely on that topic that I encourage you to look at. Um, she's, she's definitely the expert on that, that subject. Um, we are looking at, at that um, stuff in, in, in the Permian Basin, yeah. for sure. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for sharing your time and your research and your expertise. And I would like to thank everyone for attending our webinars. Uh, be sure the, to go to our YouTube channel because this will be um, archived on there along with all of the other great webinars that Rob mentioned. So thank you again, Rob. This is really, really informative. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. All right. See you next time.